Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Collective Impact Forum, the Partnering Initiative, and FSG, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, sponsored by the SCO Foundation. Implementing the post-2015 development agenda, building the backbones, platforms for partnering around the SDGs. My name is Sonia Pacheke, Director at FSG and co-author of the article, Shaping Global Partnerships for a Post-2015 World. We have a terrific program for you today with a tremendous group of speakers, but before we get started, I want to touch on a few practical items. Today's program is 60 minutes long, and you are encouraged to submit written questions and comments at any time during the presentation in the box on the lower left corner of the screen. You can also upload others' questions. The presenters will respond to as many questions as time allows during the Q&A session in the second part of the webinar. If you need technical assistance during the webinar, please email krmcustomerservice at the email address shown. Today's slides will be available following the presentation on the Collective Impact Forum website, and you'll also receive an email with the direct link. The year 2015 marks a turning point in global development. This September, world leaders will adopt the post-2015 development agenda with the promise to tackle extreme poverty, curb climate change, and put the world on a more prosperous and sustainable path by 2030. As we are getting closer to agreeing what the Sustainable Development Goals will focus on, the question of how this ambitious vision will be implemented on the ground is increasingly dominating discussions. There is widespread consensus that multi-stakeholder partnerships that can pool knowledge, expertise, technologies, and financial resources to achieve innovative and sustainable solutions will be key to implementing the SDGs. Yet there is little agreement or, in fact, shared knowledge on how to set these partnerships up for success, including in the countries and regions that need to make most progress towards sustainable development. With this webinar, we hope to help bridge this gap. We'll hear from partnership professionals and experts on the ground how to build the support infrastructure to systematically drive strong, effective partnerships for the SDGs. We call the support infrastructure backbones or platforms for partnering that convene, broker, and directly support partnerships. Before I give an overview of the important roles these backbones play in driving development partnerships, let me introduce the other contributors to today's panel. Joining me today are Darian Stibby, the Executive Director of the Partnering Initiative, who will share with us key insights from many years of working on partnerships in theory and practice. Jeffrey Kiranga, the Chief Executive Officer of the Sakot Center that acts as the backbone for the Southern Agricultural Growth Corridor of Tanzania, an international public-private partnership to boost agricultural productivity in Southern Tanzania. And Ernest Muamba, the National Co coordinator of the Zambia Business and Development Facility, set up to systematically support, catalyze, and scale cross-sector partnerships in Zambia. Let's start with a vision of what type of partnerships we need in order to meet the ambition of the SDGs. Global challenges such as poverty or climate change are complex problems. They arise from the interplay of a variety of factors that influence each other. Poverty, for example, is closely linked to access to education and healthcare and other things. Finding and implementing lasting solutions to such complex problems requires both an adaptive approach and the involvement of a multitude of actors from the public, nonprofit, and corporate sectors that actively coordinate their actions, share best practices, and all work towards the same goal. At FSG, we call the structures approach to partnering collective impact. Achieving large-scale change through collective impact involves five key conditions of success. First, and at the core of any partnership, is the common agenda. At the start of the process, partners develop a shared vision for change and agree on a joint approach to solving the problem. Then partners need to agree on how to measure progress against the common agenda through a key set of common indicators and a system for shared measurement and learning. The common agenda is implemented through activities that reinforce each other, where each partner really brings in their unique expertise and assets. Throughout the process, it is important that all players engage in continuous communication in order to align activities, share key lessons from their work, and build trust. Trust is a key ingredient in any successful partnership and is often not easy to achieve when working cross-sector. The fifth condition for success is the one that ensures that all other conditions are in place. And this is the backbone support. 
This is an independent funded team that is dedicated to the partnership and that provides ongoing support around the common agenda, shared measurement, the alignment of activities, and communication among the partners. Another important role of the backbone is to mobilize funding for its own operations and the activities of the partners. The SDGs are global goals and set global targets like the Millennium Development Goals before them. Around the adoption of the MDGs, several global partnerships were set up to focus on a specific global challenge, like GAIN, the Global Alliance on Improved Nutrition, for example, with a focus on malnutrition, or RBM, the Rollback Malaria Partnership, that works to free the world from the burden of malaria. Global partnerships were set up to pull together stakeholders, expertise, and funding at the global level, and at the same time drive change on the ground in high-burden countries. Now, these global partnerships need the support of a multi-layered backbone structure, often with a global, regional, and local level of collaboration that are interlinked. For example, SACCOT, the Southern Agricultural Growth Corridor of Tanzania that we'll hear from shortly, is a country-based initiative that is part of a global collective impact effort, the New Vision for Agriculture, that was launched by the World Economic Forum and now engages over 350 organizations in a holistic effort to boost agricultural development. Since 2009, the New Vision for Agriculture has mobilized over $10 billion in investment commitments and has catalyzed multi-stakeholder partnerships in 16 countries. Like in many other global partnerships, in the Vision for Agriculture, the global collaboration focused on defining a high-level framework for action towards a common agenda and shared measurement, while the local backbone organizations coordinate implementing partners on the ground. In addition, Grow Africa is one of two regional layers of this global effort with its own secretariat. Grow Africa covers today 12 countries in Africa and ensures the translation of the global strategy to the region as well as strong country ownership and the sharing of best practice on a regional level. We'll hear more from Mr. Kiranga about how SACOT works within this global system and how it benefits from being linked to the global and regional layer. Ultimately, as we all know, results and action are driven on the ground at the local level, and effective implementation of the SDGs requires, above all, country ownership and local leadership. Today, we therefore focus on the partnership infrastructure needed to drive progress on the ground, the local level backbone or platform. A strong backbone organization at the local level is critical as it is central to making sure the conditions for partnership success are in place. The most important roles of the local backbone are, one, translate the global agenda into locally adapted strategies and activities that fit the local context. Two, to mobilize local partners, coordinate their activities, and help raise funding for activities. Three, to support shared measurement by collecting and interpreting data so partners can really share best practices and together learn what works and what doesn't work in the implementation. And four, it needs to encourage communication among local partners and also promote external communication to keep the momentum around the issue going. It goes without saying that to perform these various tasks well, it needs a strong team with the right skills and adequate funding. Yet this is often where the challenge lies. We have seen through our work that the local backbone organization often lacks the capacity in being a good partnership broker and facilitator. It is either not fully staffed or doesn't have enough resources to fulfill its important roles. Or sometimes it is run by staff on short-term assignments or with too many other responsibilities, which is often the case when a government agency takes on the role of the backbone. In terms of funding, having adequate resources to empower the team is, of course, essential for a strong backbone or platform. Yet most donors are still hesitant to invest in partnering infrastructure and prefer to link their funds directly to programs. However, it is precisely by investing in the right infrastructure for partnering that we will have a chance of achieving the transformational change we need for a better future in the post-2015 world. I now hand over to Darian, who will go a bit deeper into some of these points and explain how to scale up partnerships around the SDGs. Thank you, Sonia, and uh, hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. 
For those of you who don't know the, the partnering initiative, we've been sort of very much uh, sort of pioneers in developing the theory and practice of partnering for about the last 15 years. But more recently, we have switched to really about looking at how do we scale up partnerships, how do we mainstream collaboration towards sustainable development and specifically the sustainable development goals. And we work in a, a range of different areas from inputting into sort of the, the international and national policies, this essential thing that we're talking about today about building the infrastructure to drive partnerships, but also looking at what is good practice in, in partnering setting standards um, in, in good practice in partnering, building up organizations to be institutionally fit for partnering, and then also around building those, those partnering competencies that, that Sonia's just been saying are so important to be able to, to drive partnerships forward. So as Sonia was, was talking, the in essence, the delivery, the implementation of the SDGs, of course, happens at the country level. And you can have all of the, the global fora in, in the world, but actually it's on the ground where the rubber hits the road. And what we see is that moving towards a, an approach to development is a bit of a, is a fundamental shift. And it means it requires government and business and civil society and UN agencies to work differently, to think differently, to look outwards for the most innovative collaborative solutions. And it, it's hard. Building partnerships is difficult. And they generally, anything other than the simplest of partnerships won't simply happen. They need direct support from highly competent professionals to really help to build up those, those partnerships and de develop them so that they are robust and set up to deliver impact. But they also need to get over quite a lot of often the mistrust between the different sectors of society as well as building awareness of a collaborative approach and help to address the lack of understanding that there, there can be. So Sonia sort of talked about some of the reasons why these are challenging and we've recently put out a, a report which is looking at emerging good practice in these platforms for partnership. And we've seen a whole range of different different challenges or what we call sort of driving forces and restraining forces within these within these platforms. Everything from the fact that one wants to be inclusive as possible, to engage a wider range of stakeholders possible. But of course the more you have, the greater the diversity of competing perspectives and makes it harder to reach consensus. We see in many areas the challenge of engaging government and the need to engage government and have their buy-in, but often there's a lack of capacity within, within government or bureaucracy within government or in some cases even the risk of governments appropriating what should or has to be a multi-stakeholder process for their own specific needs. We see also, of course, a need to really deliver results quickly. These are, in many cases, new forms new approaches to development, and they are, they are costly. They take a lot of resources, and they need to be able to demonstrate their worth. But as anyone who's been involved in partnerships knows, the actual delivery of partnerships, the process it takes to, go, to, to create a partnership can be extremely lengthy, which means the ultimate results can be very much further down the line. It's difficult for these platforms to be able to prove their worth quickly. And we've also talked about the the need for the connections into the global priorities and the global uh, support and global technical understanding. But of course, the, the risk of having top-down push is that it simply doesn't fulfill the local priorities and it risks reducing local ownership. So these are sort of a variety of the different, the different forces and restraining forces that we see, the t inherent tensions of creating these, these platforms. So how do you go about doing it? How do you actually create strong, effective platforms? And we have here just a very simple sort of life cycle of the development of a platform. And within this life cycle, in a sense, it's about creating the key building blocks that we see are, are necessary for a platform to be successful. And within this life cycle, we start off with, with scoping and, of course, understanding the, the context, understanding the needs and understanding the political, political economy is hugely important. Understanding who the key players are and their interconnections and previous history, that will all make uh, an enormous difference. Of course, one challenge is that one might do a needs analysis and come away with the, with the expressed need that, or a lack of an expressed need for collaboration. So there's got to be a certain amount of awareness raising 
building people's understanding about collaborative approaches to development. And then moving to the building phase, this is really all about, about engagement. It's about getting the right people on board, convincing, helping people to understand the value of collaboration and bringing them in to become champions for for such an initiative. And then collectively developing a very clear vision about what it wants to achieve. Identifying a host institution can also be enormously challenging because of course an institution, it needs to have the legitimacy, it needs to have the capabilities, it needs to have the connections to be able to make one of these multi-stakeholder platforms work effectively. And that includes then also developing the right sort of governance and management and operational structures. And as Sonia mentioned, indeed getting in the right resources in order to deliver on this. Then, of course, there's the implementing phase. And there's really a lot about building up the host competencies, the partnership facilitation skills and brokering skills, the, the professional management of an initiative, the membership management that is, is required to keep people engaged, and putting in place the operational structure, including a good M&E system, are all essential. And then finally, in the consolidating phase, it really is about monitoring and, and monitoring progress and being able to review and adapt to be able to, to develop the, the, the platform in ways that it can, can deliver greatest value to, to members because one of the biggest challenges we see is initial engagement from, from members and then that drops off unless there is serious value being driven. So these platforms have to continue to deliver value and, and communicate to demonstrate that. And then finally, many platforms start off with, with grant funding, but at some point they're going to have to move to a sustainable business model probably with, with sources of funding from, from multiple different places in order to ensure that they are able to stay there delivering value to all. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Daring, for sharing these insights. I mean, what I'm taking away here is really that it takes a lot of time to build partnerships, a lot of engagement and trust building, and in fact, great skill, which is why we need these platforms or backbones. We now want to hear directly from practitioners in country how this all works in practice. And we'll start off with Jeffrey Kiranga from the Sackert Center. Jeffrey, could you please start by giving us a short overview of Sackert? Hi, everybody. It's nice to talk to you this day. Um, Sackert stands for Southern Agricultural Growth Corridor of Tanzania. It is a region in the southern part of the Tanzanian country, which is a slightly the size of Italy, and uh, it's a public-private partnership that involves the government of Tanzania, the private sector in Tanzania, particularly the smallholder farmers, but also it brings on board the non-state actors and as well as development partners that are working with us in Tanzania. It has started in, in earnest in 2011, and uh, with about um, 11 partners that are local and international businesses. And now we are glad to say that it has grown to about 84 partners, and uh, we have managed to mobilize commitments of around 1 billion US dollars for investment in, in the agricultural sector, and about 30% of that is already committed to date. Um, what we want to do here is transformative agricultural development that is inclusive to enhance food security and nutrition and also environmentally uh, sustainable. Those are the key issues, and if you believe in those three issues, food security and nutrition, environmental sustainability and inclusiveness, you can become a SACOT partner. That is what I can say in, 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 in brief about what is SACOT and what we have done to date. Thank you, Jeffrey. Well, SACOT is obviously a well-established partnership at this stage. But, you know, thinking about what we've just heard about the key conditions of success for multi-stakeholder partnerships, but also some of the tensions involved, what have been the key success factors in setting up SACOT? And what were some of the challenges you encountered and how have you overcome them? Thank you, Sonia. Um, we, we have to say that the success factors have been out of the real need to develop the agricultural sector in Tanzania and as well as in Africa to respond to the global challenges of food security. 
Therefore, while we were developing our systems in Tanzania that will enable the smallholder farmers to become more productive and to develop the agricultural sector in Tanzania, at the global level, there was also a need to ensure food security. Actually, that came out of the 2007-2008 food prices spike. Therefore, there was a need at the country level, continental level, and also at the global level. The, this resulted to commitment both in the public sector and in the private sector to see what needs to be done to transform agricultural development in Africa. That is within the leadership of the government and as well as in the leadership in the private sector. Um, the government commitment is a key factor here. We are lucky that in Tanzania, the government has focused in agriculture and that allowed for the private sector also to respond to that focus and commitment in the government. And in the process also, we had excellent championship within the government, not only the government community, but also champions within the government, and also champions within the private sector, and also the farm organization, and as well as in the non-state actors. All of them committed to see what is it that can be done in a partnership arrangement that involves the government, private sector, non-state actors, as well as the development partners, that can transform agriculture in a responsible way. So, so that is what I can say. They were the success factors that enabled mm -hmm. enabled cycle to start like that. Mhm, mm mhm. Mm so, real need and and at all levels, a real commitment for change and and leadership really on all sides of of the different um, partnership um, levels and sectors and champions. Great. What were some of the challenges you encountered? There are many challenges here. Um, let me share with you some more key ones. Um, Public-private partnerships are easier said than done. Uh, many, many institutions are committed to facilitate that, but you will, you will notice that most of them are still operating in a silo environment. Um, most systems are not actually primed um, to work in a partnership environment. And uh, therefore, they are not necessarily accommodating the, the public-private partnership initiatives that everybody wants to, uh, to realize. Therefore, that is one of it. Um, and also, many, many, many partners, although they do have a common agenda, but they do not necessarily agree on how the agenda will be realized. And also, another challenge is actually to... Uh, uh, often you need to put new institutions, like the one which we have here uh, in South Court, but these partnership institutions, especially if they are PPP institutions, which are neither government, neither projects, that we all know how we can find an, a government institution or a particular program that is funded by the government or a development partner. For a PPP institution, it's like a new, new animal in the block, and nobody knows how to, really to handle it. Therefore, that has been a challenge, and that can, can, can also result to new challenges of attracting the necessary skills and knowledge that are needed to, to run and manage these complex public-private partnerships. So those have been the challenges, but um, I'm, 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 I'm glad to say that they are not unsurmountable. They can be solved, and that's why uh, from 2011 up to now, we, we, the Sackbot Institution is still around and is still growing in strength. Great, thank you for sharing that. Um, how did you go about um, bringing actors together, you know, around the common agenda and also, you know, to, to agree on how to implement the common agenda? How did you break down those silos? Um, thank you, Sonia, for that good question. Um, there has been, there, there's no one formula, but what we can say is actually to agree on a common agenda. And for the circuit initiative, we developed what we call the blueprint and also the principles on how we're going to operate. One of the biggest problems that we have in developing um, agricultural sector and developing world, especially when we are involving the private sector, is that it can be a platform for exploitation of the smallholder farmers. But remember at the beginning I told you that our principles are if you're becoming a partner, if you have to become a partner of Sarkot, you have to contribute to food security and nutrition. You have to ensure inclusiveness of the smallholder farmers 
And also, mm-hmm. you have to agree to do it in a sustainable way. By, by one to those three principles, then you become, you overcome one of the biggest fear of exploitation of the environment and also the community. And the second issue is actually uh, how to get the government support. If you have the government buy-in, then you create a stronger strength, uh, belief from the private sector, and that contributes significantly in making sure that you attract the local and as well as the international private sector that brings knowledge, experience, and capital for investment to drive forward that transformation to the sector and also the transformation at the smallholder farmer's level. Therefore, that is very, very important. And when the government comes in, you have to create the necessary environment um, uh, that is necessary to drive the changes, policy changes, institutional setup, as well as the, the, the agreed work plans and program in place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it really what what is required is change at, at different levels and really at the systems level, right? And how you manage to get people together is these these key principles that were guiding implementation and action of the different partners. That's really interesting. Um, you know, I'd love to focus a little bit on the SACOT Center as the backbone of the partnership. Um, you know, when and how was the center created and how has its role evolved over the years? The center was created in uh, 2011, and uh, it, it, it has got the role of coordinating and facilitating the partnership. Um, we can say that the role of the center is actually the guardian of those three things, both to make sure that the partners that come on board will contribute to the development of the agricultural sector, especially to contribute to food security, and not only security, because malnutrition is still a challenge in our part of the world. And the second is actually to ensure that the smallholder farmers around and also the small businesses and medium businesses around where the investment is happening are actually involved in the development. We don't want to create an island of prosperity in a sea of poverty. So we make sure that the, the issues of inclusiveness are very, very key. And we work with partners to make sure these issues are actually complied to by the businesses that we are facilitating. But also in the issues of sustainable utilization of resources. Tanzania is one of the countries in the world that are incredibly um, um, uh, blessed with natural resources from flora and fauna, animals, forests, mountains, beautiful environment that we need to protect and make sure that is available not only for generations today, but generations to come. So the center has developed the necessary partnerships to allow this to happen. And uh, for this particular one, we have the Green Reference Growth Group um, that we, 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 we implement green growth initiatives. And uh, so this is how the center is working to make mm-hmm. sure that mm-hmm. the, the, the partnership issues are addressed. Right, we, have also managed the, we have also managed to bring together the expertise, local and the international, to work with us within the country. We work with um, knowledge partners. This is a complex system. You need to bring on board the, the varieties of knowledge that can actually contribute to yeah. the realization of the partnership. Yeah, definitely. This is a really good point. And I was just going to ask, actually, you know, I mentioned earlier that, that SACOT is linked to the World Economic Forum's Grow Africa Initiative, which is a regional partnership, but also to the New Vision for Agriculture, which is a global partnership. You know, how, how does the system work and, and how does SACOT benefit from being part of this network? You already managed knowledge partnerships, but, you know, what, what else um, do you get out of being part of this bigger network? Um, I'm, I'm happy to, to share with you that uh, actually the, the, the Grow Africa Initiative learned a lot and evolved from the SACOT Initiative. Therefore, they took, uh, the, 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 the lessons from Tanzania in SACOT was taken into the African platform through the African Union, and those ones invited uh, other countries to come into the partnership now we have, um, we have countries like Ethiopia, uh, uh, Kenya, Malawi, Mozambique, Nigeria, Ghana, uh, Burkina Faso. All of 
these countries forming the Grow Africa Partnership. Therefore, this is a place where we do engage at the continental level, exchange ideas, communicate, learn experience from each other. Like right mm-hmm. now, we are implementing our things on the ground. We are learning from what other countries have done. We communicate with countries like Mozambique and also Ethiopia on how they implement the partnership on the ground. Therefore, we and also we meet in, in, in various partnerships, in various meetings at continental level. And also we go also and participate and get experience from the rest of the world. And we know mm-hmm. at the moment that Grow Asia has started. And we, we were part of the founding meetings of the Grow Asia. They are learning from us, but also we are learning from them. So there is yeah. this uh, organic linkage, linkages between these levels in support right. of our efforts. Right, so real exchange of, of knowledge, expertise, and also experiences. And of course, the, the, the personal um, you know, relationships are always really important. And you said there's a lot of meetings involved as well, which, which is, again, about building trust and really that ex, you know, fostering that exchange of knowledge. Um, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, it's been fascinating to hear about this journey, and I'm sure the audience will have lots more questions for the Q&A later on for you. Um, but I'd now like to pass on the word to Darian and Ernest to tell us about the partnership infrastructure in Zambia. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. And I think it's, a, it's an interesting um, comparison because, of course, Sankot is focused on one particular industry, which is, which is agriculture. And the, the Zambia Business and Development Facility is focusing on, on a wider uh, range of development and business sustainable, sustainability issues. Ernest, you are the, the, the manager, the director of the, of the hub in, in Zambia. I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about, about the hub and how it, how it works and operates and the type of partnerships that it's helping to support. Okay. Greetings, everyone. Um, the Zambia Business and Development Facility was created to systematically support and catalyze cross-sector partnerships in agriculture, manufacturing, extractives, and soon-to-come tourism. This work is underpinned by a theory of change that presupposes that, the, that business is key in making positive contribution and change to the country's development, whilst at the same time creating business value through cross-sector, cross-sector partnerships with government, development partners, communities, other stakeholders to achieve common goals. Our key goals are to firstly create a more conducive partnering culture by creating awareness on the role of business and development. Secondly, establish high-impact cross-sector partnerships through tailored partnership support. And lastly, eventually develop uh, the platform into a sustainable social enterprise. Uh, the facility itself commenced its operations in September 2014 with a staff of four, four brokers, that's including myself. Um, this facility is hosted by the African Management Services Company, which uh, provides management support. Uh, the, partnering, uh, the partnering initiative, which, which is our technical partner, and CEDA through the Embassy of Sweden in Zambia, who actually are our funders. We are currently developing seven partnerships across, across three sectors, that is two in manufacturing, three in agriculture, and two in extractors. In the manufacturing space here, we're looking at skills development. Uh, Zambia experienced, uh, is experiencing a shortage of skills in the manufacturing sector, and the sector actually feels the need to actually develop this. In agriculture, we are really focused on smallholder uh, farmer, farmer productivity, and access to, to markets. In the extractive sector, we're looking at uh, integrating local SMEs to participate in the growing mining value chain. I think in a nutshell, that's how we operate. We have um, a, a, a champions and advisory group that provides us link and solutions. Um, these are, uh, the, the composition of this is uh, people from government, uh, business, uh, development partners, and civil society. So this, this champions and advisory group, one of the things we found in the report is, is the importance of those, of those champions, um, particularly when it comes to sort of the wider engagement about, uh, about how to actually engage government and engage, engage business and engage others into these, into these hubs. What, what's your experience been like? What, what's proven successful in really sort of engaging all of these different sectors, uh, particularly in a country where perhaps there wasn't uh, the strongest of relationships, should we say, between government and, and business to start? How did you go about sort of engaging in both government and business? 
Well, I, th- I think key, the, the key thing here is creating a, a, a common goal ar- around them. Um, there are several reasons that drive uh, both the uh, government and the private sector to really collaborate, and these m- may include they, they are driven by certain objectives. From, from, the, from the private sector side is to really find an, an enabling environment in which to operate. From the public sector side is to find a more willing to uh, collaborative partner in terms of uh, getting business to actually collaborate. For instance, now the, the government itself is looking to, to the private sector to create a million jobs. And to do that, there's need for collaboration. So there's need for, for a really uh, harmonization of views and uh, centralization of, of, of objectives. So really understanding the, the, the objectives and incentives of each of the sectors. And, and I guess one of your roles as, as a platform is to be able to speak the language within each of the societal sectors in order to be persuasive and, and, and engaging. Now, one of the things I alluded to when talking about the, some of the challenges is about this question of uh, M&E. So these platforms themselves are not undertaking action. They're catalyzing parts of action by, by others. And that means that the, the impact actually can be very far down the line and the challenges even of attributing that impact to, to the platform. So I mean, how, how do you go about measuring and demonstrating the success of the Zambia Business and Development Facility. Okay. There is a need to develop a sound logical framework and uh, look for indicators within uh, a one to two year time frame, which we, we can measure now and show we are on the road to the ultimate goal of poverty reduction. In the short term, uh, we focus on activities that ZBIDF has to, has to undertake to create partnerships. Then in the longer term, we look at the impact of partnerships. So specifically, our short-term outcomes address uh, the extent to which uh, ZBIDF contributes to establishing effective and sustainable partnerships. So here we track things like the number of partnership agreements that have signed, the number of business enterprises involved in partnering agreements, the percentage of trainees who pursue partnerships, the level of stakeholder awareness of uh, what our facility is offering, uh, the level of div- level and diversity of active partner- partnerships, uh, participation in uh, partnership planning and implementation, and the number of partnerships uh, signed and active after one one or two years. Here we also look at the, the number of stakeholders who are actually involved in the, in the partnering journey. So you're, you really are managing to track both the, the partner and conducive environment that you talked about and also the, the, the progress of these, these partnerships through their, their logical theory, theory of change so that you can predict the, the, the impact that they, that, they will, that they will have. And of that course, relate, related to this sort of demonstration of success, um, you mentioned that the platform at the moment is, is funded by the, the Swedish Embassy or, the, or CEDA. Uh, what are your, your plans in terms of taking the platform forward? And you, you talked about creating, creating sort of a sustainable enterprise, but what, what do you see as the, sort of the, the key uh, areas of funding that you can, you can grow in order to achieve that aim? Okay. Um, one of the things that we're doing currently is also to look at, uh, like for instance, I did mention that we are, we're expanding into the tourism sector. We, we are looking to work with the International Finance Corporation here to more or less uh, set up a program. Uh, we also have uh, business that's coming our way from, uh, from, the, from the government of Zambia in terms of facilitating an innovation series on the job creation and uh, industrialization strategy. That's also bringing in uh, financing. We've also t- started uh, sell- selling, uh, we- we're charging a fee for participation in most of our, our, our training program. However, largely we are working on a business model canvas through prototype trial and evolve, moving continuously towards a model that allows us to, to be a self-sustaining enterprise. Uh, th- this may not occur in the one to two, two year horizon. We, this may, may really start, uh, the results of this may, may really start coming out maybe beyond the, th- the third and fourth year. So we, we're continually, we, we are continuing to building uh, our fee for, for service model where we actually offer a fee. Uh, for all the services that, that, that we offer. Currently, the key, the key issue based on the funding from CEDA is to actually demonstrate that partnerships actually bring value to business 
uh, there, there's always skepticism amongst the private sector in terms of uh, what we're doing because they, their consideration is that they're, they're, they're already doing it. But when, when we actually demonstrate how it's done in terms of uh, the, theory, the theory of change and the cycle that you, actually, you, you presented, there's, there's, a, there's a key understanding. Just this morning, we, we had a, a, stakeholder, a stakeholder meeting with uh, one, one core group of a, of a large uh, vegetable supply chain market that we're trying to, we're trying to create. And there's now an understanding. As I'm speaking now, we have a whole, a whole host of businesses that actually supply the vegetable industries, which, which are, who, who are also participating in a sim- similar exercise that we had this morning. And more and more alignment is, is, is being seen. The value of the facility is now gaining traction. I, I foresee that once we have demonstrated with the funding from CEDA that this principle can work, and actually the, the, value, the, the services that we, we provide as a, as a facility are of such value that they'll actually bring a lot of uh, value to a business in uh, the integration yeah. of the shared value concept with, with, within there. We'll, we'll yeah. see ourselves uh, being sustainable over the, over the four-year four horizon. Great. So by, by, by demonstrating the value to, to all stakeholders, um, that will itself, we, you hope to be able to bring in income uh, to, to, to run the facility. And of course, having sustainable models allow for scalability of these sorts of platforms. Ernest, thank you very much indeed. That was, a, that was extremely interesting. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, Ernest and Darian. Now, while we've been talking, we have received a lot of great questions from the audience, and I'd like to kick off the discussion by asking you, Darian, actually. Um, several people have asked whether the UN system is best positioned to run these partnership platforms in country, also with respect to the legitimacy of the process. What should be the role of the UN? That is a, a, a very good question. In fact, it was a question under discussion only, only this week in New York, um, where there's a view that the UN has a very strong role to play here. They certainly have, they certainly have strong legitimacy in, in country. They're well connected to, to governments, to the donor agencies, to the development agencies. There may be a challenge about the degree to which they are connected to business. But in some countries, such as Colombia, they're working strongly with the UN Global Compact Local Network and, and together actually bringing sort of the business and development actors together. I think that could be a quite a strong, uh, a strong approach for the UN. There is a question, and it's obviously country by country, though, around the, the capabilities, the, comp- the actual partnership brokering competencies um, that are required to make these happen, whether, whether the UN agencies or will have those in country. But I think that, that positioning, position wise, they can indeed play an, an important, an important role here. Great, thanks. And of course, it also depends, you know, what what other infrastructure or potential hosts are there in the country. And then, you know, I think it's a bit of a case by case decision as well. Who is best positioned to play that role? Um, as you say, depending on where the competencies are. Great, thank and I, you. I and I'd add to that that I think what's really important is that the that platform is a multi-stakeholder platform with a multi-stakeholder governance, and the host should be seen not as setting the agenda, but simply mm-hmm. providing a service to the the multi-stakeholder group. So the the UN could be part of that multi-stakeholder group. It doesn't does not have to be the one to physically be hosting the initiative. That could really be done by by any competent organisation. Yeah, we like to think of this, you know, vision of the uh, conductor from behind the scenes in terms of the partnership facilitator. Great. Um, now, you know, one topic that you talk quite a bit about um, with Ernest is, you know, the funding question. And you know, the Assembly facility is on, on its way towards a sustainable business model, which is great. But again, in the early years, um, donor funding, uh, you know, is, is always needed. And a lot of people were wondering how, um, Jeffrey, uh, you convinced donors to invest in the Sackard Center. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Thank you. That, that is a, that's a very important question. Um, convincing people to invest in an initiative is actually based on how they become part and parcel of the process itself. They should feel like they are owners 
of the initiative. They are part of the initiative. And they are not just coming from outside. You are applying for support. But you sit with them, you plan with them, and then they feel engaged. That is one thing. On the other issue is actually funding projects and the initiative, the investment themselves. It's important to have a sounding uh, and, and, and a workable project or an investment that will work, a project that will work, that will be attractive to financial institutions to risk their money in the initiative. But in the process, especially when you are considering the inclusive nature of it, if it's planned properly, the public sector, the development partners, we will be more than happy to finance the public good side of it, especially those ones benefiting the smallholders, the roads, the infrastructure, the, the training, capacity building, and as well as um, looking for, for markets that are sustainable. If these are done together in a way that is inclusive, but also in a way that is um, um, allowing for, for governments and other partners from the public sector to put their money for public goods, then you can succeed. But the key factor is to have a workable and something that is going to work, allowing for returns for investment. Yeah, yeah. And, and how do you show the value of what the center does? Um, the, the value of the center is actually, um, we normally call ourselves as the honest brokers in the process of development of these investments and uh, activities. There could be some challenges in communication between, from the public to the private sector. We do facilitate that communication as an honest partner that is trusted by both sides, but also Secondly, we do uh, have a trust and we can convene meetings, discussions around certain issues, certain value chains of choice. Therefore, we do have a convening power and therefore we allow those silos to be broken, the silos I mentioned earlier. This is, this is one issue with the center. And because the center has been created by both public and private, the non-state actors also contributing to the creation of the center. We do have access and also trust. Trust is very important. You have to deliver what you had agreed from the beginning. And this is where we do position ourselves as honest brokers and allowing communication and, and the facilitation from the public, private sector, non-state actors as well. Yeah, and, and I assume, as you said earlier, to really um, bring in all, all the partners but also the funders and make them part of the process that will allow them to actually experience, you know, the value that you provide um, in facilitating themselves. And it will, well, I'm sure, you know, help you um, get funding also for the future from them. Great, yeah, thank you. Great. Um, the next question is for Darian again. Um, one sector we've not heard much about today is philanthropy. Yet there are significant efforts underway to strengthen the engagement of the philanthropic sector around the SDGs, such as the post-2015 partnership platform for philanthropy, for example, that is co-funded by the Hilton Foundation. Now, what role do you think philanthropy could or should play in implementing the post-2015 development agenda? Great, yes, and a greatly welcome initiative such as, such as the one you, you mentioned. And I think to answer this question, I would distinguish two types of philanthropy. Perhaps the first is, is what one might think of as a traditional philanthropy or traditional charity, charitable giving, uh, which can probably support uh, traditional development. And I think that when, we, when the UN talks about Delivery, the delivering of the SDGs and how it's going to be financed and how, how many uh, tens or hundreds of billions it will cost, one can see that actually that philanthropic role will not be huge when contributing to, to traditional development. However, where I see philanthropy is, is the second type, which is about what I would call sort of catalytic philanthropy, because 
philanthropic funding is is different to donor funding it can be it can be put in quickly it can it can take risks it can drive innovation and drive new new business models and so the sort of the catalytic funding that that uh, foundations and other philanthropic givers can give uh, I think is going to be incredibly important in driving the new forms of development, in, in driving uh, new business models that can deliver key services at low costs, uh, at supporting the development of, of partnerships or, create, or, or shared value partnerships that are going to uh, also contribute to, to, to jobs and improvements in people's livelihoods and people's lives. So I think that these, these sorts of new philanthropic platforms that connect, can connect this, these sources of funding, this catalytic funding, I think and is going to be hugely important, particularly in, in trying out new approaches and, and, and new pilots that can then potentially lead to be scaled up uh, and then deliver serious impact through, through the scaling up. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Can you think of an example, um, you know, where where philanthropy has really played this catalytic role in a specific sector in development? Well, I think I think there's there's an, an, a whole range, sort of particularly around around technology that we've seen. Um, whether it is developing um, innovations um, to provide uh, pharma. Uh, prices for, for farmers at, uh, uh, at a distance for market prices for farmers, uh, whether it's, it's new approaches to delivering, to delivering um, health through mobile phones. I mean, there's a, there's a whole range of different approaches that when first started would have been seen as being, as being innovative or difficult to fund uh, by traditional, tr traditional means because it would be, the outputs would be or impact would be unknown. But then when one demonstrates it, through these programs, that's when they can be scaled up through perhaps more traditional funding means. Interesting. Thank you. Thanks. Um, the next question is for Ernest. And, you know, Ernest, the, the Zambia facility is focusing on four different sectors, you know, whereas um, SACOT, for example, focuses on, on one, agriculture. Um, what do you think in terms of how broad or how narrow a partnership focus should be and you know what are some of the advantages of having a broader focus across different sectors well in terms of uh, how broad and uh, or how narrow uh, a, a partnership should be um, this really is, is, is driven by uh, the, the parties to the table. That is, uh, you, you, whoever is uh, putting in any, any funding towards the, the way the facility is. For instance, our, our choice to actually take on uh, four sectors is driven by the need to prove, uh, to, pro uh, uh, to prove the concept that actually partnering actually works. It leads to development. But it also provides a platform on which we can we can derive those particular sectors that will show the greatest benefit towards the sustainability of of the platform as we as we go forward. Uh, we are now we we are now building up to actually collecting a body of knowledge in terms of how best to do this, which sectors are easy, easy, easy to work with, uh, which sectors actually demand demand this uh, this particular service more. For instance, in the work that we're doing with uh, with the government. Around uh, the job creation and, and uh, industrialization strategy, there's been a lot of enthusiasm shown by the agriculture sector in terms of seeing the value of what we're doing in terms of brokering dialogue between the government and agriculture. There is also a lot of emphasis, uh, impetus coming out of the tourism sector in terms of what we're doing in terms of bro brokering dialogue between the tourism sector and uh, and and government. So I I see the way we the way we started this is that we yes we started broadly, but as we go f go forward beyond uh, this funding level, I see I see the facility itself narrowing down to probably two sectors that provide economic value towards its sustainability. Uh, the choice. For 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 Sakot is uh, is driven by the fact that they're in agriculture. I appreciate that, and uh, agriculture is key in everything that we do here. But the development choices of this country have got implications in terms of the extractive sector. Within the extractive sector, we are seeing uh, an alignment with the agriculture sector. So the agriculture sector 
comes comes back into the manufacturing sector because now there's this drive around or the needs to actually do uh, value addition. So as, as uh, a narrow focus would have denied us the opportunity to actually learn exactly what opportunities lie within each sector, where, where the, the greatest demand would be, would, would be demonstrated by the work that we're doing. And this is how we've, we're being influenced now to actually mo- expand from the current three sectors to actually include agriculture, uh, to include, mm-hmm. include tourism, rather. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, interesting. So this really allows you to go where the greatest needs are, but also where the opportunity is. Um, Jeffrey, I'd love to hear your perspective on this question, given you know, you're running um, a very single-issue-focused partnership. Thank you, Sonia, for, for this question. Um, for, for anybody that has worked in agriculture, we'll know that, and we think that, um, and let me put it this way, we know that in agriculture, in order for agriculture to develop, you need services of other sectors. Agriculture cannot develop in isolation. Um, one of the reasons why we have the Southern Agricultural Corridor is actually because of the availability of the backbone infrastructure, the railway and the, the, the roads, the, the port facilities, and also the exit points in the borders of the countries that are bordering us, including Zambia where my brother Ernest Mwamba is, and also DRC in Malawi. Therefore, in agriculture, you need the services from power, communication, you need education and training. Also, you need um, a connection with other sectors like water and, and, and also other sectors like health for the people that you are serving. Therefore, although it is a single sector, but what we say in, in agriculture here, we have a saying that is, uh, for agriculture to develop, you have to put agriculture first. By saying agriculture first does not mean that you put all the money into agriculture, but let's, we, 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 we convince other sectors in their planning, because the majority of our mm-hmm. people are in agriculture, to plan consciously what are they doing in support of agriculture. If you have anything yeah. wrong, if you are building power, if you are building health services, how are those are going to impact in the agricultural sector? Therefore, although SASCOT is a single sector approach, but yeah. its success depends a lot from what other sectors are also doing to support yeah. the people that we are serving in the agricultural sector. And, and that is really reflected in the corridor approach, right? It's also really about bringing in and creating and strengthening the enabling environment for, for the focus. Great. Now, Jeffrey, I just have one last question for you. Um, you know, SACOT started in 2011, and a lot has happened since. Now, when was the moment that you knew you had turned a corner in making the partnership a success? Do you remember a specific moment? Yes, um, I do remember the specific moment. First of all, it's at the very beginning of it, when you have great enthusiasm and a gang home and a spirit, let's make it happen from the government and the private sector, agreeing that they're going to make it happen and develop the blueprint and the launching of the blueprint and how to, how to implement inclusive development in agriculture. That is based on partnership. That is one. And the second moment was actually last year, December, when we had the first uh, Sarkot Partnership Forum where we had more than 150 partners from all over the world and within Tanzania coming and looking at what we have done, what sort of investment we have facilitated, how much smallholders, 25,000 smallholders that are being impacted by the investment that have been facilitated by such good partnership. And people applauding that, that gave me a confidence that what you are doing is something useful for the country, for Africa, and also for the global food security. I can imagine. Thank you for sharing these, these great moments with us. Now, as this discussion has shown, building that partnerships is not easy, and there's a great need for sharing experiences and best practices. Unfortunately for today, our time is up. We have received many more questions than we could answer, and we look forward to continuing the conversation. So thank you all for joining us today in this webinar on implementing the post-2015 development agenda. We hope you've enjoyed the presentation and discussion. Special thank you to our panelists, Darian Stibbe, Jeffrey Kiranga, and Ernest Mwamba. 
I'd also like to thank the hosts of today's webinar, the Collective Impact Forum, the Partnering Initiative, and FSG, as well as our supporter, the Skoll Foundation. To continue the conversation on Collective Impact, we invite you to visit the Collective Impact Forum website and join the online community. You will also receive an email with direct links to today's presentation and other relevant materials and online fora. Now we would like to ask you now to take a moment and complete the evaluation that will appear momentarily on your screen. Your comments and suggestions are important to us as they help us to provide you with future quality programming. Now thank you for joining us today and we look forward to continuing the conversation.